The following 15-minute program has been purchased by the Independent Voters of Illinois, Incorporated. Good evening. MacArthur sits astride the islands of Japan. Admiral Halsey has sailed into the waters of Tokyo. The curtain has rung down on this, the most tragic of all wars. We in America learn quickly how to use the tools of destruction. The $64 question in the mind of everyone is, can we now employ the same hair trigger efficiency using the tools of peace and construction? For light on this subject, let's listen now to the voice of the independent voter, Mr. Studs Terkel. Hello, folks. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of a press or of the right of people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Verbatim, that's the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, the bell cow of the Bill of Rights. All this is old stuff, folks. We take it for granted, the air we breathe. Political rights guaranteed by Uncle Sam. But the history of our generation gives us fair and ample warning that something new must be added, and quickly, without stalling. Something like bread and butter. Something like a job at decent pay for every American, ready, willing, and able. An economic right guaranteed by Uncle Sam, without which those political rights we so fondly cherish and brag about may disappear like so many threads of gossamer. For when a man is hungry and the cupboard is bare, he's a sucker for the first fascist demagogue to reach the balcony. Mussolini, remember him? Hitler, remember him? And now he's in our backyard, too, waiting. Waiting for a good, juicy depression. And today there are 400,000 idle in the city of Detroit, one of the arsenals of democracy. And on the West Coast, thousands of good men and women are muttering, where to, what next? And here in Chicago, the layoff is in vogue. And in cities of New Jersey and Massachusetts, the chimney smoke is thinned out, and ghost town is more than a word. Yesterday, the President of the United States, in a 16,000-word message to the easygoing gentlemen in Congress assembled, outlined a program of action, 21 points, 21 stones forming the arch of prosperity, a keystone of which is the full employment bill, jobs for all, underwritten by Uncle Sam. Two weeks ago, a Chicago businessman spoke his piece in Washington. He meant no words. He was for the immediate passage of the full employment bill. He gave reason. He cited chapter and verse. Senator Bob Wagner, chairman of the committee conducting the hearings, commented, it is a splendid statement that should be read by all the businessmen of the country. Mr. Clarence Adelson is with us this evening. He's the businessman who testified. And we should like to ask him a few questions. First, credentials. Mr. Ravelson, suppose you tell us a little about yourself. I am the chairman of the board of the Republic Drill and Tool Company of Chicago. We have an invested capital of about $3 million and employed a total of 2,100 workers during the height of our wartime expansion. Our post-war personnel will probably be around 600. Well, then you had experience in meeting payrolls. For the past 25 years. Mm -hmm. You're also president of an organization known as the New Council of American Business. Now, what sort of group is it, and what's its purpose? We are in the process of organizing. A number of us businessmen had felt for a long time that many of the public policies sponsored by the National Association of Manufacturers and the United States Chamber of Commerce are not as progressive as they should be. We decided the time had come for liberal and progressive businessmen to form a group of their own and let Congress know that there are a lot of businessmen who do not agree with the NAM. Well, Mr. Ravelson, you believe in free enterprise, don't you? Absolutely. The private enterprise system has been good to me, and I want to see it preserved. But I'm afraid the horse and buggy philosophy frequently expounded by the NAM will not fill the bill. Not in a changing world. Not in this age of the atomic bomb. A new, more realistic approach is badly needed. It is later than they think. Is that why you're in favor of a full employment bill? Exactly. I feel we're wasting our breath in talking about the glories of the free enterprise system if we can't provide the people of this nation with steady jobs at good wages. We can ride the cycles of boom and bust for only so long. Unless something's done about it, and soon the people will get fed up and change the system. <laughs> It's rather unusual hearing a successful businessman say that. I don't think so. I try to be realistic, that's all. The private enterprise system is a privilege, not a right. Well, what do you mean by that, Mr. Adelson? 
It's a privilege granted to the businessmen and investors of this country by the people. It's not a God-given right. If the people feel this privilege is being abused, if they walk the streets jobless, they will do something about it. I have no doubt that another deep depression would mean the end of the free enterprise system as we know it today. We all know that the mine owners of England realized that they had a privilege which they abused and the people took it away. The people of England voted for nationalization of the coal mine. They exercised the people's prerogative under a democracy. Since America is also a democracy, the same thing can happen here. Well then, those who shout free enterprise is in peril as they fight the full employment bill are themselves endangering the system. Exactly. It might be that the NAM's interpretation of free enterprise and mine are not the same. That's why we formed the new Council of American Business to represent primarily small and medium-sized businesses, the type of businessmen who supported President Roosevelt because they felt he was really trying to preserve the free enterprise system by doing more for the common man. But this bill, Mr. Appleson, this Murray-Wagner-Patman bill for full employment, there are some who say that it will regiment American business. How about that? Not at all. One has only to read the bill. Private industry is given every chance in the world to provide jobs for all. But if it fails, the government will step in and take up the slack. The ultimate responsibility will rest with Uncle Sam. This is as it should be. Everyone knows that the businessman cannot guarantee continuous employment for his workers. And if it's true that the right to a job is inherent in a free society, the ultimate responsibility must rest with that authority which is subject to the will of all of us, namely the government of the United States. Mm -hmm. When you speak of the right to work, the right to a job at decent pay as an inherent right, just what do you mean, Mr. Addison? Well, we know that all Americans regard our political rights of free speech and free press as inalienable. Yet they are meaningless freedoms unless a man is able to support himself and his family. To have those basic necessities of food, shelter, clothing, and medical care and a reasonable amount of leisure. If we are to maintain those political rights for which so many have given their lives in these recent years, we must admit the necessity to add to those rights another which is most basic and upon which the other rights depend. That is the right to work to earn a decent living and to do something creative for oneself and one's fellow men. Well, that makes pretty good sense. It's too bad that some of your more conservative associates don't see it that way. I feel the same way you do about that. Too often our business leaders have neglected the forest of national interest for the trees of immediate profit. Too often have they fought laws that have redounded to their ultimate benefit. Well, for instance? Well, Take the case of the investment bankers. Most of them fought the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Today they realized that their business would never have revived without it. But in the early days, they objected violently. One day, the business conservatives who are against the full employment bill will realize it was the best thing that ever happened to them. Once upon a time, I remember, the bankers fought the insurance of federal deposits tooth and nail. Well, as it turned out, it saved thousands from bankruptcy restored confidence in the banking system. Exactly. Confidence is the key word. The full employment bill, if strengthened and properly supplemented by other laws, will give the wage earner confidence in the future. Without that, we're on a rocky road. Well, how do you figure, uh, Mr. Appleton? If a man is assured of a job, if the fear of unemployment doesn't haunt him anymore, if he knows his purchasing power will be stable, he will spend. He will not fear the rainy day. It is the purchasing power of the wage earner that makes the wheels of our economy go round, not what the men in Wall Street or LaSalle Street say or think. Mm -hmm. Well, specifically, how will the full employment bill, say, affect your business? My plant makes tools which are sold to auto manufacturers. If Joe Dokes is assured of a reasonably steady job, he will buy that family car he's dreamed about so long, and then everybody gains. But if Joe is without a job, or lives in fear of the pink slip, he will hold on tight to whatever savings he has. He will not buy the car. The auto manufacturer will not buy my tools. All of us will be left holding the bag. Then, in the long run, it boils down to a matter of self-interest. Absolutely. 
the self-interest of all of us, businessmen, working men, farmers, consumers, are interdependent. The full employment bill will help us all, and that is why I hope Congress will pass the law without delay. Well, Mr. Abelson, you spoke of other measures that must be passed by Congress in addition to this bill. You mean the bill alone won't turn the trick? No, it merely shows us the way. The full employment bill, as it now stands, is far from perfect. There is room for a lot of improvement. But its basic concept of government assurance of jobs for all must be followed through. In the President's message to Congress, he advocated uniform unemployment insurance, $25 a week for 26 weeks. I agree most heartily. In this critical reconversion period, the purchasing power of the wage earner must be maintained. Mm -hmm. I notice, though, that Congressman Doughton of North Carolina says this measure will encourage loafing. I do not agree with him. A maximum payment of $25 a week for 26 weeks, provided the man is idle through no fault of his own, will not encourage loafing. It's strange indeed that those voices who cry, leave business alone and we shall have prosperity and a rising standard of living, consider $25 dangerously high. Well, of course, it, it might be that Congressman Doughton and certain of his colleagues from the South are thinking in terms of the pre-war pay of sharecroppers, and that certain of his colleagues from the North are perhaps thinking that a lower unemployment insurance figure might induce workers to accept jobs at any pay the employer sees fit to give. That brings us to another bill that should be passed. That is the law raising the wage standards from a 40 cent minimum to a minimum of 65 cents per hour. I believe it's sponsored by Senator Pepper. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's the purchasing power of the working man that is paramount, is that it? Absolutely. I think a rising standard of living is possible for America and for the world. But we must act fast. There is no time to be lost. We must avoid another depression. But it will take planning today, not tomorrow, if free enterprise is to survive. Tomorrow may be too late, and the federal government must take the initiative. Thank you, Clarence Adelson, chairman of the board of the Republic Drill and Tool Company, and president of the new Council of American Business. May both your organizations prosper. And now a word from Norm Pierce.